EFCC arrest former Minister of Power Saleh Maman in connection with alleged 22 billion era fraud. In Oshun State, workers celebrate with Governor Ademola Adeleke following yesterday's Supreme Court judgment. Court bars National Broadcasting Commission NBC from imposing fines on broadcast stations. On the foreign scene, Pakistan's former Prime Minister Imran Khan pleads not guilty to corruption charges after his arrest has sparked nationwide protest. Good evening, this is News at 7 on Western Spring Television. My name is Femi Olani Pekum. Former Minister of Power Salim Aman has been arrested and detained by the Economic and Financial Crimes Commission EFCC in connection with an alleged 22 billion era fraud. Mr. Maman, who was minister under President Muhammad Buhari from 2019 to 2021, was arrested today and is being detained at the headquarters of the anti graft agency in Abuja. Reports say the arrest is connected to investigations into alleged corruption and execution of some power projects. Mr. Maman is accused of conspiring with staff of the ministry in charge of the accounts of the Zingeru and Mambila hydroelectric power project to divert 22 billion naira and share amongst themselves. The investigations uncovered properties in Nigeria and overseas allegedly linked to the suspect, while millions of naira and dollars have reportedly been recovered. Following yesterday's Supreme Court judgment, the Shun State Workforce today welcomed Governor Ademola Adeleke to his office amidst drumming, singing, and dancing. According to the workers, Senator Adeleke has been a people's governor whose victory deserves to be celebrated. Our reporter, Olayinka Ali, was at the state secretariat and files in this report. <laughs> This was how the entire workforce of the Ocean State Secretariat at Biri welcomed Governor Ademola Adeleke to office following his victory at the Supreme Court today. The workers could not hide their joy as they came out in large numbers to welcome the governor with attacks to comrade governor. Governor Ademola Adeleke appreciated the workers for their love towards him and for believing in his administration, reassuring them of his commitment to serve the people and govern them with the fear of the Almighty. <laughs> The deputy governor, Kola Dewusi, could not stop appreciating the Almighty for their victory. <laughs> Former governor of Ocean State, Olagun Soyo Yinola, was on ground to felicitate with the governor. He stated that Governor Deleke is going to do well because he is a product of his party, the PDP, and he believes the people of Ocean supported the governor because they have seen his ability and have believed that if Adeleke remains governor, there will be progress in the state. Adeleke is a product of my party. I am, by the grace of God, his predecessor in office. I believe the people of Ocean And they have believed that it will continue from where we stop. And I can say with every confidence that progress has returned to us. The 
Nigeria Labour Congress NLC Kiatika Committee Chairperson of the Ocean State Council, Comrade Mudukiola Yemisi Uyedele, who spoke on behalf of the work, has applauded the governor on his good deeds since he assumed office and thereafter urged him not to relent in his promises to the workers. <laughs> It would be recalled that the Supreme Court upheld the election of Governor Dimola Diliki on Tuesday, May 9th, 2023. Olainka Ali, Western Spring Television News. And in time, former Russian state governor, Gwye Gaoye Tola, says he has accepted the ruling of the Supreme Court, which upheld the election of Adimola Diliki as a state governor. A five-member panel of the Supreme Court yesterday held that the Court of Appeal correctly reinstated Senator Adeleke as governor. In a statement, the former governor said he accepts the ruling in the interest of peace and development of the state. Mr. Oyetola, candidate of the All Progressives Congress, APC, in the election also asked his party supporters to accept the verdict as the will of God. While he prayed for prosperity for Governor Adeleke's government, Mr. Oyetola urged him to deliver good governance to the people. Earlier, acting APC chairman in Oshun State, Tajidin Lawal, said the party has also accepted the verdict despite its displeasure. The Oshun APC said it will keep to its opposition role in the state and not cease keeping the governor on his toes. Moving on, the presidential election petitions court has adjourned a petition filed by candidates of the Labour Party, Peter Obi, for further pre hearing. The court had previously adjourned the case to today for continuation of the pre-hearing, which commenced on Monday. At the hearing today, counsel to the petitioners Livio Zoko told the court that the parties in the suit have agreed to seek for an adjournment to enable them to file and exchange processes. The lawyer added that parties have also agreed to meet and decide on the documents that are not in contention and the ones that are controversial. He prayed the courts to adjourn the case to May 17th. All other counsel in the suit consented to the adjournment. Consequently, the five-member panel of justices, led by Harunat Samani, granted the application. And while speaking to journalists shortly after the court session, Mr. Ozoku said he has filed a motion before the court seeking to have the proceeding televised. Candidate of the People's Democratic Party, PDP, Atiku Abubaka, has also filed a motion asking the court to televise its proceedings. The Action People's Party, APP, has withdrawn its petition challenging the victory of Bola Tinubu in the February 25th a presidential election. At a pre-hearing session on Monday, APP's lawyer, Obed Agu, said instead of proceeding to the main hearing, Parties can choose to settle disputes amicably. The court then adjourned the case for further pre-hearing. And at the resumed court session today, Mr. Agu moved an application to withdraw the petition. Counsel to the respondents, Wali Olani Kweku and Latif Agwimi, did not oppose the application and did not ask for cost. Consequently, the petition was dismissed. It will be recalled that the Action Alliance had withdrawn its petition against Senator Tinubu and the APC on Monday. With the dismissal of two petitions, the court is left to determine three other petitions by the candidate of the PDP, Atiku Abubaka, candidate of the Labour Party, Peter Obi, and the Allied People's Movement. And staying with judicial matters, a federal high court in Abuja has barred the National Broadcasting Commission, NBC, from imposing fines on broadcast stations in a ruling today, Justice James Omotosho said the NBC does not have judicial powers to impose penalties. The judge also set aside fines and posts on 45 broadcast stations by the NBC. On March 1, 2019, NBC sanctioned 45 broadcast stations over alleged ethical infractions during the general election. Displaced with the fines, media rights agenda sued NBC, citing the action of the commission violated the right to a fair hearing under, under, under the Constitution. In his ruling, Justice Omotosho said the Commission acted as a complainant.
court and judge when it acted on the alleged infractions. The judge added that the Nigeria Broadcasting Code, which empowers the Commission, cannot confer judicial powers on NBC to impose criminal sanctions or penalties. He said the Commission is not the Nigeria Police Force, which has the power to conduct a criminal investigation, adding that NBC's action is against the doctrine of separation of powers. The Chief Judge of the Federal High Court, Justice John Soho, has ordered the reopening of the Benin City Judicial Division following earlier closure due to the threat of flood. The directive is contained in a statement by the FHC, FHC Assistant Director of Information, Catherine Obi Christopher. It notified members of the public that the division has been relocated to the venue formerly used by the Court of Appeal. The location was within the High Court complex opposite Benin Correctional Center on Sapele Road in the Adosted capital. In other news, President-elect Bola Tinubu has traveled out of Nigeria for a walking visit to Europe. Senator Tinubu departed the country via the Muritala Mohammed International Airport in Lagos today. His media aide, Tunde Rahman, said the President-elect will use the opportunity of the visit to fine-tune the transition plans and programs and his policy options with some of his key aides without unnecessary pressures and distractions. The president-elect is also expected to hold meetings with investors while in Europe. Mr. Rahman said Senator Tinobo would return to the country shortly before his swearing in on the 29th of May. In April, Senator Tinobo returned to the country after spending one month abroad. He had traveled to France to rest and later attended Lesser Hajj in Saudi Arabia. In the meantime, the European Union says it is keen to work with the president-elect Bola Tinubu to build a mutually beneficial relationship with Nigeria. The EU ambassador to Nigeria and the economic and community of West African states ECOWAS, Samuela Isopi, said these in Abuja during the celebration of Europe Day. Mr. Isopi said the EU has always remained Nigeria's biggest trading partner and the organization is eager to work with the new government for further gains. According to him, a democratic, peaceful, strong and prosperous Nigeria is in the interest of Europe and the world. Senator Tinubu is set to take over for Muhammad Buhari as Nigeria's next president after inauguration on the 29th of May 2023. Elsewhere, Governor of Ondo State, Aruti Miyakiri Dulu, has faulted the zoning arrangements by the All Progressives Congress APC for the leadership of the 10th National Assembly. In a statement today, Governor Akiri Dulu expressed concern about the decision of the party of the, of the leadership of the incoming National Assembly. He said the zoning formula represented early signs of steps aimed at attempts to cabin the ad hand presidency. For Bola Tinubu by a few individuals with eyes and Asurok power buttons. The governor said proposed APC zoning formula for National Assembly leadership positions is a skewed arrangement that reinforces injustice and enhances inequity. Governor Akiri Dulu said it stands logic on the head that one geopolitical zone northwest of a favored with two presiding officers positions out of four while North Central suffers the consequences for its innocence and shrewd loyalty by having none. The governor who rejected his own formula said the move was an unworkable arrangement that reinforces injustice and enhances inequity. And the Speaker of the House of Representatives, Femi Gwajabi Amila, has met with members-elect of the 10th Assembly, the meeting with the right select, including returning and new lawmakers, was held behind closed doors at the Transcop Hilton Hotel in Abuja. A sit-down was organized by a coalition of eight political parties, including the All Progressives Congress APC. The coalition is led by lawmakers loyal to Representative Bujabi Amila and President-elect Balatinobu. The meeting took place amidst opposition to the nomination of Tajuddin Abbas for the speakership position of the APC. In the meantime, members, uh, member of the House of Representatives, Tajuddin Abbas, says he is elated about his nomination for the position of Speaker by the All Progressives Congress APC. Representative Abbas spoke while briefing journalists after a meeting with members-elect in Abuja. 
On Monday, the APC nominated representative Abbas and Benjamin Kalu as its preferred choice for the Speaker and Deputy Speaker positions in the 10th Assembly. The election of principal officers of the Senate and House of Representatives will take place early next month. Following the nomination, other APC reps in the race expressed reservations over the party's decision, insisting that they will not step down. Commenting on the development, Representative Abbas said his camp is reaching out to all the speakership hopefuls to reach a truce. And while some lawmakers elect have been declaring support for Representative Abbas ahead of the election of principal officers of the House of Representatives. Uh, I'm Engineer Suleiman Ayarich, uh, member elect to the conference for welfare conference in Kaduna State. Uh, which political party, sir? PDP. Okay. APC as a party, like you said, has sat down and uh, zoned the positions of the leadership of the National Assembly. And uh, from what I read, the Speaker House of Representatives is zoned to the Northwest and they allotted Tajijin uh, Abbas. No, I'm okay with that at least because the position has been zoned to my zone and not only to my zone, to my state, Kaduna State. You of course. Well, my name is Wright or Mugumamene. I represent Kama Bukana for that constituency. I'm the Bodiman from River State. Also, German House competition on those communities in the present house. Your party? I'm the PDP. Well, I think uh, it's good. And I think for the very first time, we need to all come together. Of course, you can say I'm the public PDP. Um, we have elected to the line of you know, the majority party, particularly when it comes to the issue of stabilizing the house. Uh, because we find in uh, the in, uh, in the fire, we find him by someone who listen to everybody. I will carry up with everybody's, uh, every caucus will be fully represented. There was panic today after fire guarded some buildings within the Nigerian Air Force Base along Airport Road in the Federal Capital Territory. The cause of the fire outbreak that guarded the military base beside the Nigerian Correctional Service National Headquarters is yet unknown. The reports say the timely intervention of operatives of the Federal Fire Service helped put out the fire. Head of Operations FFF, FCT, Amiola Adebayo said firefighters worked hard to completely put out the fire. Ms. Adebayo, however, said he could not confirm the cause of the fire outbreak yet. Plateau State University says its security operatives repelled an attack on the campus by gunmen. The school authorities said some gunmen invaded a female hostel of the institution in Bocos between last night and today, but there was no abduction. Institution's public relations officer, John Agams, said the criminals attacked the institution to kidnap students, but they were repelled by local security men in the university. The vice chancellor, Professor Bernard Mato, appeals to students to be peaceful. And in River State, the police command says its operatives have nabbed a three man syndicate which specializes in vandalizing streetlights and cutting away its parts in for the Kiri axis of Port Harcourt. The police said the street lights were facilities provided for the community by the Niger Delta Development Commission. In a statement, spokesperson of the command, Grace Iringe Koko, said the operatives made the arrest after it received credible information from some leaders of the community. She said the investigation was ongoing to apprehend other members of the gang, as well as receivers of previously stolen items. In another development, the police said its anti-cultism unit, while on routine stop and search along GRA Port Harcourt, arrested a suspected armed robber who hid a revolver pistol in his car. And staying with security, armed men said to be members of the Indigenous People of Biafra, IPOB, have shot a bank security guard 
during a shootout with police operatives at Inko Market, Ikeala, local government area of Anambra State. It was gathered that the armed men came out in large numbers on a motorbike and started shooting sporadically in an attempt to rob a bank and to enforce a seal at home order announced by a faction of the IPOB. Reacting to the development in a statement today, the state police spokesman, DSP Tochuku Ikenga, said the hoodlums attempted to disrupt commercial activities and vehicular movement in Hiala until a joint operative of police and other security forces responded swiftly and thwarted their move. He said calm has returned in the area as police with other security forces have intensified patrols and improved security dominance and surveillance in the state. In Ondo State, no fewer than three persons were feared killed in a clash that occurred between two rival coast groups in Owo Town. It was gathered that the clash occurred around 9 p.m. yesterday. While the cause of the clash is still unknown, State Commander of the Motekunko Akogwa Detunji Adeleye, who confirmed the clash today, said his men were on the ground to bring the situation under control. You're watching News at 7 on Western Spring Television. Still to come, Pakistan's former Prime Minister Imran Khan pleads not guilty to corruption charges a day after his arrest has sparked nationwide protest. We'll bring you more on these when we return. legendary queen of Zazao is best known to historians as Queen Amina of Zaria, an old world town and capital of the Hausa state of Zazao. Amina was a great warrior and the first woman to rule the ancient kingdom of Zazao. Her 34 years as queen witnessed an unprecedented expansion of Zazao by conquests. Queen Amina of Zaria belongs to the class of Amazons by the might of her army and her strength of conquest. She opened Zaria to trans-border trade and was said to have initiated kola nut cultivation in the ancient kingdom. The Hausa Muslim figure was born in 1533 and died in 1610 at the age of 77 years. Folklores remember Aminatu, the queen of Zazao, as a brave, smart and talented leader whose giant statue now adorns the National Arts Theatre in Lagos, Nigeria while many educational institutions bear her name. Western Spring Television identifies Queen Amina as a watershed character in history. Born 16th September 1923, named Harry Lee Kwan and known as Lee Kwan Yu, he was often addressed by his initials of LKY. Lee Kuan Yew was a barrister and the first Prime Minister of Singapore between 1959 and 1990. Educated at Raffles Institution from 1936 to 1940 and the Fisa William House between 1947 and 1949, Lee Kuan Yew established a highly effective and anti-corrupt governance system that midwives the transformation of Singapore into a high net worth income economy within a generation. He never hid his exception to Western mode democratic ideal, which he believed had not assisted developing nations to attain good government. Before his death on the 23rd March 2015, the People's Action Party, which he founded, had used its political influence to establish the United World the College of Southeast Asia to expand his economic ideas among countries that constitute the Asian Tiger. Western Spring Television identifies Lee Kuan Yew as a major character in history.
welcome back. Uh, this is still news at 7 on Western Spring Television. A reminder of our headlines. EFCC arrest former Minister of Power Salim Ahmad in connection with alleged 22 billionaire fraud. Oshun State workers celebrate with Governor Ademola Adeleke following yesterday's Supreme Court judgment and court bars National Broadcasting Commission NBC from imposing fines and broadcast stations. On the foreign scene, Pakistan's former Prime Minister Imran Khan leads, pleads not guilty to corruption charges after his arrest sparked a nationwide protest. The 9th and 10th batches of Nigerians fleeing war-torn Sudan have arrived at the Namdi Azikiwe International Airport Abuja. The Nigerians in the Diaspora Commission said the 9th batch of evacuees departed Port Sudan International Airport and landed in Abuja around yesterday. But the 10th batch arrived today. Malaysian and update chairman of the Nigerians in the Diaspora Commission, Nitkam Abikedabiri Erewa, confirmed that the 10th batch of evacuees from Sudan were already done with their documentation. So far, 1,856 evacuees have returned home since the evacuation exercise started on May 3rd. And here in Oshun State, residents have stated their expectations as the Supreme Court upheld the election of Governor Ademola Adelike yesterday. Olayin Kali spoke to a number of residents who want the governor to focus on education, infrastructural development and social amenities. Following the Supreme Court's decision in upholding Senator Ademola Adelike as the governor of Oshun State, residents of the state have stated their expectations from the governor. Ayodeji Anderson is an indigenous of Oshun who wants the governor to put into full use the potentials of the state, like exploring the minerals in the state, which he believes can generate more income for the state. Uh, perhaps first to focus on the strengths of Oshun and uh, uh, put to full use the potentials of, of the state as a whole. Like uh, we are rich in mineral resources. Many people know that uh, Elisha, for example, there's gold in Ilefe and Oshu. All here in Oshu state, there are many, many economic minerals. Abdulwaid Badmos, in his opinion, wants Governor Adeleke to improve on the area of education because he believes every child has a right to education. And once the education sector is focused on, it is certain the future of every child in the state will be bright. Look at education policy. The national policy of education is not a, a rigid thing. A lot of people do not understand the um, Aregbechola policy of education, right? You should go back and look at it, regardless of the um, way Aregbechola has arranged it. For Bright Abayomi, the governor should focus on all sectors, particularly on women and aged. It should it shouldn't focus in one aspect. It should touch all the areas, like um, concerning education, road, um, social amenities. So it should do everything perfectly. Femi Fakunda also stated that he expects the governor to surpass his predecessor, focusing on the areas of security, health, social infrastructure, and education. Let us look at infrastructural development. He should do more. He should build on the legacy his predecessors and even surpass it have done. Uh, what about security? Insecurity pervades the nooks and crannies of Nigeria these days. If the place is secured, there will be what I will refer to as foreign direct investment that can actually improve economic development of Oshun State. Meanwhile, Governor Ademola Adeleke reassured the residents of Oshun of good governance when he addressed newsmen at his residence in Ede on Tuesday, shortly after the judgment was announced. Olainka Ali, Western Spring Television News. On the foreign scene, Pakistan's former Prime Minister Imran Khan has pleaded not guilty to corruption charges a day after his arrest sparked nationwide protest. Police say nearly 1,000 people have been arrested since Mr. Khan was held in Islamabad on charges which he denies. 
The arrest dramatically escalated tensions between Mr. Khan and the military at a time of economic crisis. Conviction would permanently disqualify him from standing for office while elections are due later this year. Eight people are now reported to have died in violent protest that broke out across Pakistan following Mr. Khan's arrest. And while British Prime Minister Rishi Sunak says Imran Khan's arrest is Pakistan's internal matter. The United Kingdom has a strong, deep, multi-dimensional relationship with Pakistan. And there are over 1.5 million British Pakistanis here, and many of them are dual nationals, as am I. The Prime Minister will have seen the scenes coming out from Pakistan, the civil unrest where people have lost their lives due to the detention of the Prime Minister Imran Khan. There are real concerns about the circumstances of his detention and the right to have a fair trial. The United Kingdom has in the past sent observers to hearings around the world to ensure natural justice is done. Has the Prime Minister considered that? If not, will he consider it? Prime Minister. Well, Mr Speaker, I thank my honourable friend for his question. The UK, of course, has a long-standing and close relationship with Pakistan, and this weekend, especially as Commonwealth partners. The arrest of the former Prime Minister is an internal matter for Pakistan. We support peaceful, democratic processes and adherence to the rule of law, and we are monitoring the situation carefully. In the United States, Congressman George Santos, a New York Republican, has been charged with fraud, money laundering, and the theft of public funds. In a 13-count indictment, he is accused of laundering funds, lying to Congress about his income, and illegally receiving unemployment benefits. Repub Republicans hold a slim majority in the House of Representatives, and whatever happens with Mr. Santos could cause political waves. It emerged shortly after his election to a Long Island district last November. And Mr. Santos had lied about key aspects of his biography. The lawmaker, who is still in court, has rejected calls to quit Congress, including from fellow Republicans. He has been accused of falsely claiming his mother perished in 9-11 and of stealing money fundraised for a dying dog, amongst other things. This legal process is going to play itself out. Unfortunately, this is not the first time a member of Congress from either party has been indicted. There are a set of rules, and as uh, the majority leader stated, he voluntarily had stepped down from his committees. Uh, we are committed to making sure that we root out uh, any fraud when it comes to unemployment uh, pandemic assistance, and we're working to have uh, support from our conference, and it's good policy, and we urge the Democrats to vote in support of it. But still in the United States, a jury in a civil case has found that former President Donald Trump sexually abused a magazine columnist in a New York department store in the 1990s. But Mr. Trump was found not liable for raping E. Jean Carroll in the dressing room of Bechtoff Goodman. The jury also found Mr. Trump liable for defamation for calling the writer's accusations a hoax and a lie. It is the first time Mr. Trump has been found legally responsible for his sexual assault. A jury in a civil case has found former President Donald Trump sexually abused the magazine columnist in a New York department store. Donald Trump sexually abused writer E. Jen Carroll in the 1990s and then defamed her by branding her a liar. The jury decided, delivering a legal blow to the former U.S. president as a sixth re-election in 2024. The verdict was read out in the Manhattan Federal Court on Tuesday afternoon just hours after jurors began deliberating following a seven-day civil trial. The nine-member jury of six men and three women determined on Tuesday that the ex-president did not rape Carol, but they did find him liable for sexual abuse and defamation. The jurors awarded the former Al Magazine columnist approximately $5 million in compensatory and punitive damages. And because this was a civil case, Trump faces no criminal consequences. Carol, who held hands with her lawyers as the verdict was read on Tuesday, left the courthouse with Cap smiling while in sunglasses, entered a car without speaking to reporters. In a reading statement later in the day, Caro said she filed the lawsuit against Donald Trump to clear her name and to get her life back. She said the world finally knows the truth and the victory is not just for her, but for every woman who has suffered because she was not believed. The former president who has denied Ms. Caro's accusations did not attend the two-week civil trial in the Manhattan Federal Court. This was a circus 
atmosphere. Um, and having him be here would be more of a circus. And again, what I said in the summation yesterday, you know, reigns true, um, holds true. It's that, you know, what more could he say other than I didn't do it? And he said that on the road here. And he, you know, it's hard to prove a negative Molly. I can say you stole my pen. Prove you didn't do it. How would you prove it? Say you didn't do it, right? I mean, it's sort of where we're at. So, you know, it's, it's, it's very simplistic to say, oh, he should have testified. He had nothing to say other than what he's already said on the road. Trump immediately lashed out with a statement on his social media site, claiming again that he does not know Carol and referring to Tuesday's verdict as a disgrace and a continuation of the greatest witch hunt of all time. Mr. Trump's lawyer said the former president plans to appeal against the decision. The acts of Hollywood did not come in this case. There's a federal rule for 403 that balances out inflammatory measures or things, and that certainly was one of them. So, but there's plenty of issues to appeal. And uh, look, that's what happens, right? You know, we are, we're in one sense gratified. And I know some people in this camp are very happy um, that, you know, the rape claim was rejected. But, you know, I'm not. And uh, I am happy about that, certainly. But I'm not happy that he was found liable for anything whatsoever because on the 70s, I didn't think he should have been. The trial saw a tense cross-examination between Ms. Carroll and Mr. Trump's attorneys. Her legal team called 11 witnesses to corroborate her claims that Mr. Trump had assaulted her in the lingerie department of the luxury store in 1995 or 1996. Mr. Trump called no witnesses and appeared only in a video of a deposition that was played for jurors in which he denied rape. It didn't happen. Um, and, and by the way, if it did happen, it would have been reported within minutes talking about going to a major floor probably I assume the most important floor uh, a major floor in a major department store that's a very busy store by the way and check out counters and everything else and I, I would be in there I mean it's the most ridiculous it's the most ridiculous, disgusting story. It was just made up. Mr. Joe Takapina sought to cast doubt on Miss Carroll's story, which he called a work of fiction. He questioned why Miss Carroll could not specify the date of the attack, agreeing that it stripped Mr. Trump of the chance to provide an alibi. The former L. Magazine columnist was able to bring the civil case against Mr. Trump after New York passed the Adult Survivors Act in 2022. The law allowed a one-year period for victims to file sexual assault lawsuits in the state involving claims that would have normally exceeded statute limitations. It remains unclear if the verdict will have an effect on Trump's political chances as he remains the early frontrunner for the Republican nomination in 2024. The former president faces a host of other legal issues including criminal charges in New York relating to a harsh money payment made to a porn star in 2024. 2016 and a Justice Department investigation into his alleged mishandling of classified documents. Temi Tokbe, Ajijalalwala, Western Spring Television News. In the Middle East, Palestinian militants in the Gaza Strip have fired more than 60 rockets towards Israel after the Israeli military said it carried out a series of airstrikes and Islamic Jihad rocket launchers. Health officials say at least two Palestinians have been killed in Gaza. But there are no reports of any serious injuries in Israel, where most rockets are said to have been intercepted. This comes a day after 15 people in Gaza were killed in Israeli airstrikes, including three Islamic Jihad leaders. Islamic Jihad swore revenge, but there was no rocket fire overnight. Instead, the group warned Israel to expect its reaction anywhere at any moment. Meanwhile, Israel's Prime Minister said any escalation from militants will be met with a crushing response. In Africa, two worshippers and two security guards have been killed in a gun attack near Africa's oldest synagogue on the Tunisian island of Jeba. The attack took place during an annual pilgrimage to the island, which attracts Jewish visitors from Europe and Israel. A guard reportedly shot dead his partner before opening fire on visitors and security forces near the Kirba synagogue before being killed himself. The two dead worshippers who were cousins have been named by Israeli media as French national Benjamin Haddad and Eviel Haddad, a dual citizen of Tunisia and Israel. Tunisia's former tourism minister who organized the pilgrimage and was inside at the time said the two cousins had tried to hide behind a bus outside the synagogue. 
Paul Sila aired. President Mohamedou Buhari seeks Senate's approval of $800 million loan to be secured from the World Bank. We have more on this and other business stories. After this break, please do stay with us. an anti-apartheid activist who gave his all for the elimination of what has been described as the world's most vicious rule of the unjust and man's inhumanity against man. He was born July 18, 1918 in Mveso, South Africa, educated and trained as a successful legal practitioner. He took up the gauntlet of a human activist against segregation by the minority of whites through primitists in South Africa. At the climax of his trial for treatment, orchestrated by the minority South African government. The great crusader for democratic equality was prepared to pay the supreme sacrifice to establish majority rule in his native land. He told white jurists that if achieving freedom for his people was worth his life, he was prepared to die. Nelson Mandela spent 27 years in Robin Island, described as the most notorious prison in the world. It was from this same prison that he came out as a free man to assume office as South Africa's first black president in 1994. Western Spring Television identifies Nelson Mandela as a watershed character in history. Jeremiah Oyeni Obafemi on March 6, 1905. Obafemi Awulowo was a prime architect of Nigeria's independence and most consummate advocate of free education and social welfare in Africa's most populous nation. Erudite politician, thinker, and philosopher, Awo was fondly addressed by associates and political colleagues, brought his unique attributes to bear on governance in the defunct Western region. He administered as leader of government business and the premier between 1955 and 1958. Obafemi Awolo's premiership witnessed pioneering in the multi-sectoral policy initiatives and execution. The Western region under his administration paraded several enviable records. First television station in Africa, first real estate in Nigeria, first high-rise building in Nigeria, first modern sports stadium in Nigeria, first agricultural settlement in Nigeria, first modern civil service secretariat in Nigeria, and first industrial estate in Nigeria. His face is on 100 Naira denomination as a mark of honor for his distinguished services to his country. Western Spring Television identifies Obafemi Awulowo as a major character in history. Welcome back. And now to business. Senate President Ahmed Lawan has read a letter from President Muhammad Buhari requesting for the approval of an additional financing of the National Social Safety Net Program to the tune of $800 million to be secured from the World Bank. Senator Lawan read the letter today as he welcomed his fellow members to a new legislative day. President Buhari said if the request is approved, 5,000 naira will be transferred about 60 million poor Nigerians, which would stimulate the informal sector and improve health and education. The president said in order to guarantee the credibility of the process, digital transfers will be made directly to beneficiaries' accounts and mobile wallets. The request comes days after the Senate approved the sum of 22.7 trillion naira that was spent by the executive arm of government without the initial approval of the National Assembly. The Nigerian National Petroleum Company Limited says its subsidiary, the Nigerian Gas Marketing Limited, has inaugurated a 150 million naira standard cubic feet per day natural gas city gate facility in Ogun State. The inauguration was in partnership with Transit Gas Nigeria Limited, a subsidiary of Accela. In a tweet today, the National Oil Company said the state governor, Dapo Abiodun, inaugurated a facility 
which is located in the Bethlehem community. An NPC said infrastructure is expected to supply natural gas to industrial and commercial clusters in Ogun and other surrounding neighborhoods in the southwest region. And still talking business, the United Kingdom Supreme Court today ruled in favor of British multinational oil and gas company Shell over a 2011 offshore oil spill. The apex court ruled that it, if it was too late for Nigerian claimants to sue Shell subsidiaries over the oil spill. The case was one of a series of legal battles Shell has been fighting in London courts against residents of Nigeria's oil producing Niger Delta. In December 2011, there were allegations that an estimated 40,000 barrels of crude oil leaked when a tanker was loaded at Shell's Bonga oil field. Shell disputed the allegations and said the Bonga spill was dispersed offshore and not have and did not have adverse effects on the shoreline. A group of 27,800 individuals and 457 communities have made several attempts to drag Shell to court, arguing that the spill polluted their lands and waterways, destroying farming, fishing, drinking water, mangrove forest, and religious shrines. But a panel of five Supreme Court justices unanimously upheld rulings by two lower courts that found they had brought their case after the expiry of a six-year legal deadline for taking action. A British national extradited to the United States last month has pleaded guilty in New York to a role in one of the biggest hacks in social media history. A July 2020 Twitter hack affected over 130 accounts, including those of Barack Obama and Joe Biden. 23-year-old Joseph James O'Connor pleaded guilty to hacking charges, carrying a total maximum sentence of over 70 years in prison. The hacking was part of a large-scale Bitcoin scam. O'Connor, who was extradited from Spain, hijacked numerous Twitter accounts and sent out tweets asking followers to send Bitcoin to an account, promising to double their money. O'Connor from Liverpool was charged alongside three other men over the scam. Mexican football legend Antonio Cabajal, the first footballer to play at five World Cups, has died aged 93. Known as La Tota, the goalkeeper played at the Brazil 1950, Switzerland 1954, Sweden 1958, Chile 1962, and England 1966 tournament. Cabajal held the record alone for 32 years until it was equaled by Germany's Luther Matthäus. In 1998, he won 48 caps for his country, 11 of which came at World Cups, in addition to 409 appearances at club level. The majority of his 18-year playing career was spent at Mexican side club Leon, where he played 364 games during a 16-year stay. The club said it would open the doors to its stadium tomorrow to allow fans to pay their last respects to Cabajal after his achievements in company of his family. In Europe, West Ham manager David Moyes believes reaching the Europa Conference League final could be the greatest achievement in his long managerial career. The Hammers take on Dutch club AZ Alkma in the semi-finals with the first leg in London tomorrow. West Ham have not reached the first European final in 47 years, while Moyes has never managed that feat as a manager. It certainly uh, made me realise that it is you know, every tournament you play in is incredibly difficult to get to a semi-final or a final. Certainly here, for example, to to win any of the major trophies in, in the UK with the quality of the teams. We saw one of them last night playing a game. Uh, the standard of the football teams that you've got to beat. So I think what we've done in, a, in Europe last season and getting to the final, the teams we had to beat, uh, we obviously lost to the winners of the, the competition in Eintracht Frankfurt. And uh, I think this year, again, we, we're season been more difficult. I think this year has been an amazing achievement. And we know it's, a, it's seen as a, a lower competition but I think still to be at this stage is, is great for us and uh, 
I said before, we don't. You can't take European football for granted because every year, you know, there's so many teams in the in the Premier League trying to get in that position. With us finishing sixth for the Europa League and last year seventh for the Conference League, uh, no, that's that's no mean feat. And uh, we know probably now it looks like is well more than certainty we can only get to Europe through through winning the winning this competition. So it'd be great if we could try and do that again. Tiger Woods has been ruled out of the 2023 PGA Championship as the 15-time major champion continues to recover from an ankle injury. It is the third time in seven years the 47-year-old American will miss the tournament. Three-time major winner Jordan Spieth will take part, having been a doubt after withdrawing from the AT&T Brian Nelson this week for a wrist injury. The PGA Championship is being held at Oak Hill Country Club in Rochester from 18th to 21st May. Woods has struggled since a car crash in February 2021 left him with severe leg injuries. And away from sports, 79-year-old Hollywood star Robert De Niro has confirmed he has become a father for a seventh time. He broke the news in an interview with ET Canada about his forthcoming film About My Father. De Niro, who has six other children from previous relationships with three women, did not reveal the identity of the mother of his seventh. The Hollywood veteran has won two Oscars for his roles in The Godfather, Part 2, and Raging Bull. And that's all at this hour. But before we go, here is a recap of our major stories. Former Minister of Power Sali Maman has been arrested and detained by the Economic and Financial Crimes Commission EFCC in connection with an alleged 22 billion euro fraud. Following yesterday's Supreme Court's judgment, the Ashun State Workforce today welcomed Governor Ademola Adeleke to his office amidst drumming, singing and dancing. The Federal High Court in Abuja has barred the National Broadcasting Commission, NBC, from imposing fines on broadcast stations. And the foreign scene, Pakistan's former Prime Minister Imran Khan has pleaded not guilty to corruption charges a day after his arrest sparked nationwide protest. Please do follow us on our social media handles on Facebook, Instagram and Twitter at Western Spring Television. You can also watch us live on our YouTube channel at Western Spring Television. My name is Femi Olanike. Thank you so much for watching. Good evening.